Let's go. All right. Welcome to our uh, Thursday night New York Giants Preservation Society meeting. Tonight we have Armand Peterson, uh, who contributed to that great book. I think, uh, who is it? Uh, Mr. Klink has the copy in front of him. The team that time won't forget, the 1951 New York Giants. And Armand's going to be speaking tonight on Gus Westrom. He's been dear to the hearts of uh, New York fans, uh, New York Giant fans, and New York Met fans, for that matter. Um, next week, we are going to be taking our Thanksgiving break. So happy pre-Thanksgiving to all of you. I hope you have a lovely holiday with your families. Uh, we will then regroup on December 1st with Jeff and Helene Rhodes, Dusty Rhodes's uh, children. Uh, so that should be a very, very uh, interesting night, as sh tonight should be. So without further ado, I introduce Armand Peterson. Armand, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Stay, yeah. the floor is yours. Yep, enjoy being here. The, uh, the, the uh, West Western bio was actually first published in, in a book in 2007, Minnesotans in Baseball. It was a, a group project by the Halsey Hall chapter of Sabre uh, to have a number of uh, members get involved in a group project. And uh, uh, I wrote uh, a bio on Wes Westrom and Jerry Kuzman in that one. And when the 1951 Giants uh, book came about, they, they asked for, for some of us to uh, submit to that. I did a minor minor edit and turned it in, but it was a it was always a good uh, good project. I'm I'm a, a former amateur town team ball player, and I was a catcher. And I always, when a bio subject comes up, if he was a catcher, I try to try to latch onto it to write. And uh, of course, uh, Western being a Minnesotan is a uh, is a uh, it was a joy to write about. Unfortunately, uh, the the book was came out about 2007, and, and West died that year. And the museum that uh, up in his hometown had had been closed and and torn down, and the, the artifacts sent to his uh, daughter in uh, Arizona. So I didn't get a chance to to uh, meet with uh, Wes or even to tour the museum, uh, but I did get to talk to a couple townspeople that knew him. So I, I got to do that as well. Uh, um, I wasn't sure how to proceed, but I, I wanted to start out by telling you that I'm a I'm a baseball fan, uh, probably more towards the amateur game than I am to the major leagues, although I, I follow the Minnesota Twins now, and I was, uh, uh, I'll admit in a little bit later here on who what my favorite team was when, when I was growing up. But uh, a, an old friend of mine and I wrote a book, Town Ball, The Glory Days of Minnesota Amateur Baseball, that covered uh, our town team baseball from the end of World War II to 1960. In 1950, we actually had uh, 799 adult teams competing in the league for uh, championships and state tournaments. And right now I'm involved in a, the, uh, the first state tournament in Minnesota was in 1924. And next year will be the 100th anniversary. And uh, another fellow and I are, are working on writing a booklet to commemorate the 100 years uh, I'm, I'm writing it in the form of a of a graphic book using illustrations and photos to tell the story, and I found that's an awful lot harder to do than uh, than I thought. Uh, when you sit down to write a nonfiction book, you generally can write an outline and you know discuss the themes you want to discuss. When you when you're doing a book like I'm trying to do here now we have the theme, but then what do you have to show? And, and uh, going back in time, it's not always possible to get good photos and illustrations and that. So it's uh, it's probably takes me uh, 10 times the amount of time to write one page as it did, you know, if you just write text, but, but it's a great project. And I thought I'd start by just introducing myself, showing you how I grew up to, uh, to love the game of baseball. Uh, that might be a little different from the from the rest of you. I I was born in a small town in uh, East Central South Dakota in 1941. Population there was about 600. 
in a, uh, in a little over a year, we moved to a small town in northeastern North South Dakota called Hammer. Less than 100 people. It's now a ghost town. The house I've toured there and the house we lived in is, is still there, but it's sort of leaning about 45 degrees. Uh, uh, there, was, there was no, the only boy in town that was my age was about two to three years older than I. My dad wasn't an athlete. Uh, we didn't have anything to do with sports, so so I never really heard of baseball until about I was about eight years old, and we visited some cousins uh, in in South Dakota who were farmers, and two of my cousins were town team baseball players, and I I got kind of excited to watching them play a game on a Sunday afternoon. Um, and my my uncle, their father, gave me a baseball glove and a ball and a bat to to go home with. But of course, I had no one to play with. And then uh, uh, in 1950, we moved to a town in Western Minnesota called Clarkfield. That was about population 1,000. And we had a big vacant lot in front of the house we lived in and uh, perfect for a, for a ball field. And we had about five or six guys, maybe eight, who could play, play catch or play baseball. We, we mainly played workup. I don't know if a lot of you have played that. If we get six players on a field, you could put four of them in the field and two batting and, and you bat until you went out and then you rotate around the field to play. Uh, when you had that few, we, if you're a right-hand hitter, the rule was you couldn't hit to right field. You had to pull the ball or, or hit it way to straight center. But there was no organized baseball then. Until about 1950, I moved, we moved to a town in Hutchinson, closer to the Twin Cities, population about... Uh, I think it was around 4,000, 5,000 people. And the second year there, the, we had a, a organized peewee baseball. And that's a, equivalent to a little league now. You, the, you were about eight to 12 years old. Uh, and uh, I went out for that team, started the year in the peewees, and I got uh, promoted to the midget team, which is 13 to 15 year olds, and, and got to play two games uh, we, we took buses to play uh, adjoining towns. So I really got a fix on, on uh, football or on baseball. Uh, I had a, a beloved coach who was a former minor league ball player, a great athlete, August Davis, converted me to a catcher and kind of uh, took me under his wing. But my friends and I, we, we played baseball everywhere. And when practice was over, we'd go to a vacant lot and we'd play uh, if we had enough, we'd play a workup or something, or we'd play with a practice golf ball or a cork or a wiffle ball, whatever we could find. And then when the town team was playing and they played three games a week and we'd go out on the home games and we'd run out in the outfield and shag flies during batting practice. So we, we were playing baseball all, all the time. My, uh, my best friend's father uh, ran a hatchery in town and in the winter, there wasn't a lot of activity in there, and we, we could set up a field uh, to play baseball with a practice golf ball. <clears throat> they had a truck parked in there. The, up, the, uh, the box was a left fielder, and the, the mud flaps were the third baseman and the shortstop. And my friends, uh, we, we'd play like the Cardinals versus the Yankees or something like that, and we'd have to bat left-handed or right-handed. I remember uh, I always argued with him when he was when he was uh, pitching whether I whether a switch hitter you know whether I had to conform to the, whoever the pitcher was or I could do what the uh, what the guy in the major leagues was actually doing. But it was <coughs> baseball all the time for us. We started collecting what we called bubble gum cards. Now I, you're going to call them trading cards now, but uh, we first uh, got involved in it in. What, uh, what the people now call the 1952 cards, we call them 51s because that was the statistics that were on the back of the, on the, back of the card. And, uh, and uh, 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 my recollection is that we got a stick of gum with every card. I mean, it was, I had a stack of, of uh, bubble gum on top of a dresser, it must've been six inches tall or something like that. And what we would do is we would collect those cards and we'd play games, we invented a game where we threw uh, three dice and we went in a process of working it out. Like if you got triple sixes, that'd be a home run or triple ones, that'd be a home run. And we were playing that all the time. We, uh, you know, we, we got it so that the scores were 
fairly reasonable. We could have you know single digit scores in the games. It worked pretty well. And uh, now this is where my first collection or co connection to the Giants was in uh, in those fifty one season cards. I'll call them fifty two. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we had about six or eight of us who were our avid collectors, and uh, none of us had uh, from the Giants had West Westrom and Whitey Lockman. We kept buying cards to try to figure it. Now I had a backup catcher. So we played the Giants, I could put him in my lineup for our, our dice game, but then a neighbor or a, a classmate in school uh, heard some of us who wasn't a baseball fan and he had a bunch of cards and he said, well, he said, uh, you know, I got a bunch of these here. You can have them if you want them. And, and I picked them up and uh, he had about a hundred cards and one of them was Whitey Lockman. The other was one, another one was West Westrom. And the neighborhood bully uh, heard that, uh, of course, the word got around that I, I was the only one in town that had those two cards. And a, a kid named uh, Rocky Betker, your classic uh, bully, lived about two blocks from our home, came over and he said, uh, he said, those cards aren't yours, those are mine. He said, Russ said he was going to give them to me. And I said, well, I didn't hear that. So he he took after me and uh, and uh, tackled me and was going to pummel me and the there happened to be a two by four laying there. So I picked that up and swatted him, damn near broke his arm. His arm. And he went uh, went away and threatened that he's gonna come back and, and uh, take it out on me. But uh, I think I scared him off. So I, uh, but that, that was my first uh, affair with the, with the Giants. Uh, we, we didn't have a television then. We, we first, uh, I went in 1952 went with my dad to a local pool hall. Uh, and bar that that had a television set, and I on the weekends I got to watch the uh, Yankees and Dodgers in the in the series. Um, and then in uh, in August of that year, I I went out to my uncle's farm that, and started working harvest for him. Now I was only eleven years old, but I could drive a tractor on the road. The uh, left uh, South Dakota didn't have driver's licenses at the time, so I actually drove a truck with a load of grain on on the on the highways helping out in the small grain harvest. But there I've got my second connection to the Giants. Uh, a meeting I attended uh, a couple of weeks ago where the presenter uh, was telling her story on Don Mueller, mentioned that Mueller uh, sharpened his batting eye. His dad would pitch uh, uh, kernels of corn at him and he'd, he'd bat at him with a, with a broomstick. He said he sharpened his eye and gave him a good uh, you know, eye to hand coordination. Well, I'm I, at the farm in South Dakota. They uh, <coughs> they had a pile of corn cobs. Now, in today's farming, uh, uh, the corn is picked and shelled at the picker sheller, and and uh, the, it's stored and dried. Back in those days, they they just picked the ears and they put the ears in storage uh, to dry out. Uh, and uh, they, someone would come up with a sheller and uh, and shell the corn maybe a year, next spring or the summer and leave you a pile of corn cobs. Now at that farm, uh, the corn cobs had two things. Uh, one is they, uh, the lady of the house had an old cast iron stove uh, that uh, she used uh, corn cob for fuels to, to do the cooking in. But one of my cousins said, uh, you know, we used to sit out here and bat these cobs. So they, they had a regular field there with a fence for the pig pen and a barn and a granary could have a small a, a small game and we'd pitch corn cobs to each other and bat now they had a, a regular regulation baseball bat a little bit too big for me but I could choke up on a 34 and get around on a corn cob anyway so uh, uh, we we played that a lot and it was a kind of a fun game depending on how how wet the, the cobs happened to be or wh what the length was you could kind of throw a, a bender uh, at least a right-hander with a corn cob, you can throw a like a screwball. So it was uh, uh, for me as a youngster, just baseball all the time. Um, my uh, one more connection with the with the Giants is in 1954. I, I I came down with a bone disease and was had to be hospitalized. They thought it was rheumatic fever at first, and uh, I I was hospitalized and then. For about a month, and they sent me home, and uh, they, my folks got a, a, a hospital bed that they could crank up, 
and put me in the living room so I could see we just got the television set that year. And I was excited because I got to see I could see the whole World Series. Uh, I would not just the weekend games. And of course, the Giants disappointed me by winning in four games. So it took away almost half of my joy. Uh, in, in 1956, we moved to a, uh, a town about 30 miles away from Hutchinson called Hector, about a thousand students uh, or a thousand population, about 37 in my graduating class, <coughs> compared to what would have been 120 or so in, in Hutchinson. But in, in early 58, I ordered a, a game called APBA, which APBA, or as I call it, Armin Peterson's Baseball Association. And it was, uh, it had the, in the 58 game, but it had the 57 uh, cards. And I'd always seen that advertised in sporting news and other places and I wanted to try it. So it turned out it, it was a pretty good, pretty good game. And some of my friends there uh, uh, got in, invested in it and we started playing, you know, weekend tournaments or we'd have drafts or we'd just get six guys together and play a tournament or whatever it was. And we were playing that all the time. A matter of fact, we one night uh, on December 28th, uh, 1958, <coughs> we were out of friends farmhouse out about five miles out of town playing APBA. And is that you remember that was the famous Baltimore New York Giants NFL playoff game. And we took a break to watch that. And when we <coughs> started playing some more and when we looked outside. And my parents called and said, hey, you guys better come home. There's a blizzard coming here. And we looked out and it was just no way we were going to even get out of the driveway of the farm place. So, so we assured all our parents that we were safe and, you know, they, they had heat and, and we would just hang in there. Of course, we did what responsible young baseball fans would do. We didn't go to bed. We just played APBA all night. So, so the later on when I uh, started college in 59 and 60 we I brought the game to the, the dormitory and and we had a bunch of guys playing it there as well and our uh, our grad student resident assistant uh, even played with us but he said uh, a week before finals week he confiscated the game and locked it up he said you're not you guys are not going to play another game until until finals were over so so thank goodness for that because we probably would have all flunked out if it wouldn't have been for for that, but so that's a little bit of uh, um, my um, my uh, my cousins in in South Dakota. This is I've got a mission to make. They were they were New York Yankees fans, so they got they kind of got me indoctrinated into them, and they they were my uh, became my favorite team. Their their favorite players were Joe DiMaggio and Dr. Bobby Brown. Uh, for some reason, they picked uh, Bobby Brown, and I got invested in uh, in Mickey Mantle in in uh, you know in the early 50s when he came on the scene but i switched my allegiance to uh, uh to minnesota twins when they started up in minnesota in 1961 uh, was able to go to a, a, a couple of yankee games that year um, and uh, one of which i saw i think maris hit a home run so so that's where i come from in 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 baseball the uh in the Saber Bio Project, I think I've written eight or nine. Now, it's, I like to find interesting people to write about, and uh, and Wes Western was certainly a kind of a, a love affair of mine because he was a, a neat, humble guy, uh, uh, overcome a lot of adversity and injuries in his career, and uh, and I just wished I would have been able to uh, uh, to meet him in person and talk to him. So that's a that's my uh, uh, my preamble here. Now I know a, a couple. Uh, the last meeting I went to, the the author read her her story. Now I don't know whether you want me to go through the whole thing like that or or hit some highlights. Uh, uh, I'm going to think. You know, a lot of the data that's in these articles you can find in Baseball Reference, and you know they don't need to be repeated. But but I'll start. And uh, I'll read a couple of uh, paragraphs on the, on the introduction. It starts with, uh, Wes Westrom was a superb defensive catcher for the New York Giants in New York City's post-World War II golden years. 
when the Yankees, Dodgers, and Giants won 17 of 24 league pennants and 9 of 12 World Series between 1946 and 57. Western was selected to the National League All-Star team in 1952 and 1953 and caught all six games of the Giants' loss to the Yankees in the 51 World Series and all four games of the Giants' sweep of the Indians in the 1954 series. He was pictured with Milwaukee Waves slugger Eddie Matthews and umpire Augie Donatelli on the cover of the August 16, 1954 inaugural issue of Sports Illustrated. He later managed the Mets and the San Francisco Giants. It was quite a journey for the humble athlete who had been born Wesley Noreen Westrom on November 28, 1922 in tiny Clearbrook, Minnesota, 1940 population of 425 nestled in the far northwestern part of the state, 250 miles from Minneapolis, and a world away from the major leagues. Westrom starred in football, basketball, and baseball in high school. He was a bruising fullback. He was listed as 5'11 and 185, which was a pretty big lad in those days in high school. And many of his old friends and opponents thought football was his best sport, but he got a chance to play professional baseball while still in high school. Gary, if you could put that photo up. Sure. <laughs> um, uh, he, he signed with the Crookston uh, Pirates of the Class D Northern League in 1940 while well, he was still a junior at Clearbrook High School. Because of a scarcity of summer jobs in those days, the, uh, the high school leagues permitted uh, students to play professionally as long as they didn't play during the uh, uh, during the uh, school season. So here's a photo of the Crookston Pirates in 1940. And you may guess the, the young man on the second from the left on the bottom row is Wes Westrom. Right there, I, I got this photo from, uh, from the fellow uh, third from the right on the top. Name was Clint Dahlberg. He was uh, 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 a little bit older than, than Wes. Uh, played minor league baseball and was a real, real solid uh, town team ball player in the Minnesota amateur circles. So it's kind of interesting to find a, a Western initially couldn't sign because or he was going to sign with Crookston, but the high school league said he couldn't do that until after, until after school uh, term ended. So he played about a month with a town team in, uh, in Plummer, Minnesota, and then before he went to play with uh, with Crookston. So you can uh, you can take that off if you'd like. Um, he uh, he was hired as an understudy to player to catcher manager Fred Neisler, a, a 10 year minor league uh, veteran. <clears throat> and he got some extended playing time when Neisler injured a foot. Western himself lost three weeks in July when he severely cut his right wrist on a team bus. Foreshadowing, I thought, the many injuries that would later plague his career. He finished the season with a 275 batting average, three home runs, and 23 runs batted in. The, um, the Miller signed him uh, uh, to a contract uh, for 1941. Uh, the, the, the American Association was in the highest class in the minors, the, the class double A. He played in, at Eau Claire in the Northern League, which was now a class C league. And he had a great year hitting 330 with seven home runs and 70 RBIs and was voted the uh, league's all-star catcher. Uh, he went to spring training with the Millers in 1942 and was optioned to Little Rock in the class A1 Southern Association. He had an injury and, and hit poorly. He, he sat on the bench uh, all year, only had 104 at bats with a 202 batting average. The Millers still uh, were, uh, were uh, high on him and considered switching him to the outfield. They brought him back to spring training in 1943, but he was drafted and went in the service, but he spent most of his time at the, at the Green, uh, Greenhaven Army Barracks near Poughkeepsie, New York. Greenhaven had been built as a, and was a brand new, still unused maximum security state prison used by the army to house deserters and other military miscreants. Uh, Western later joked that 
that experience was valuable in helping him deal with the hapless New York Mets. He said uh, it was good training for the Mets. He also met his future wife, Josephine, in Poughkeepsie. They married and made their uh, made the city their home during the uh, uh, during the off season. Western worked as a, a youth coach at the YMCA, played some semi-pro basketball, and eventually became a deputy sheriff in Dutchess County. The uh, the Giants uh, purchased his contract, or or be, he became the property of the Giants in '46 when the Giants purchased the Minneapolis Millers. Uh, he went to Jacksonville, Florida in the Class A Sally League, where he had a solid year, played in the All-Star Game, hit 275 with eight home runs and 56 RBIs. And in spring training the next year, Western confessed that he'd been too tense in spring training with the Millers in 42, <coughs> and, it, and it hurt his performance at Little Rock. He said he finally figured it out during his three years of military service. And it was the cruel reality that all baseball players must confront, that even the best hitters fail the majority of the time. He said, I reached the natural baseball conclusion, he told Minneapolis Tribune writer Halsey Hall, you do or you don't. So I stepped up the plate, just relaxed, and let the pitcher worry. He was also working hard at the time, uh, protecting his right hand. By his own count, he suffered eight broken fingers in his 11 seasons in the major leagues. In addition, he was plagued constantly by sprained or jammed fingers. As an aside, uh, catching gloves of the 40s and the 50s demanded a two-hand catching style with the right hand uh, uh, used to trap the ball in the pocket. What catchers did would wait, wait with the pitch with their bare hand clenched in a fist next to the glove and try to open the, the hand at the last minute. Now, I, I was taught that to put my thumb inside my finger like that. Other people said you'd use just a regular grip. This one seemed to work, but the problem was the uh, uh, the ball's coming kind of fast. And, uh, and if you, most of the time, if it hit the glove, unless you were lucky, it would pop out if you didn't get the hand in there. I remember uh, when I was playing in uh, Tomball, the, the, the team provided the catcher's glove and what we would do is they take the take the glove, smear it in glove oil, put a baseball in the pocket, put twine around it, and uh, and uh, tie it up tightly, and then throw it in a bucket of water, and let it sit for a couple of weeks, and then you take it out, and you had a pocket kind of formed in the thing. Uh, what what I did was I I used my new glove for batting practice and infield practice, and used the old limber one during during games. And uh, I suspect that uh, that uh, a lot of the, the pro players were doing doing the same thing because that was taught to me by my by my old coach. The flex hinged gloves that are common today uh, didn't come along to the late '60s, pioneered by the Cubs, uh, Randy Hundley and uh, Cincinnati's Hall of Famer Johnny Bench. Uh, some old time catchers were better or lucky at avoiding hand injuries, but the gnarled fingers were definitely an occupational hazard. Some folks said it was easy to pick out a retired catcher in a room full of retired players by just looking at his hands and his bent fingers. Um, there are ways to try to avoid it with no one on base. <laughs> you didn't, it, it wasn't so important. Uh, but on the other hand, if, uh, if you're dropping a ball, it, it doesn't give the the uh, umpire confidence that uh, that the pitcher's throwing the ball where he's supposed to be. So it's a it's a tough tough call for a catcher. But in getting back to the West here again now in '47 he hit 294 with 22 home runs, 87 RBIs with the with the Millers. Uh, he was voted the All Star for the American Association, even though they didn't have a game. They they did vote for the All Star team. He was called up in September for the Giants, but uh, all-star Walker Cooper of the Giants was chasing Gabby Hartnett's record 37 home runs in a season by a catcher. So uh, West didn't get much playing time. He, uh, he only had 12 at-bats. Uh, uh, Cooper, by the way, fell short. He only had 35. 48 was not a, not a good one for him. Uh, he won the number two catching spot in spring training. 
beating out uh, a 33-year-old journeyman, Mickey Livingston, who had played uh, almost 500 games in the majors over 500 seasons. Um, Western got an opportunity when Cooper had a knee surgery, but uh, he hit only 127 in his first 34 games, wound up hitting only 160 in 125 at-bats. <clears throat> they sent him to Jersey City in the Class AAA International League in 49, and he got off to a rip-roaring start. He hit 308 with 15 home runs, five of them grand slams in just 51 games. He was called up on June 14th, just after Cooper was uh, was traded to Cincinnati. Uh, now here's a here's a story that's kind of interesting. It's been told many times. Uh, uh, Cooper or um, Western told Steve Bitker in his 2001 book, uh, the original San Francisco Giants, the Giants of '58. Western said he had just broken a finger prior to call up, but Rocher told him to just put a piece of tape around it and rub it in the dirt. You're catching Giants Ace Jansen. Bob Mayer reported a similar, similar story in the November 2001 Baseball Digest article when Westrom said that, uh, gave another version of the, of the story. Uh, and he said that the events took place after uh, Western's late September call-up in 47, you know, not in, uh, not later. And I looked it up. The facts are that Western did, did catch his first major league game on September 17th, 1947 in Chicago. He went two for four. The Giants lost, but Jansen did not pitch. He, Western did catch Jansen's two to nothing win over Cincinnati in June 14th, 1949. So it's just possible Western got his facts confused in the Meyer interview. It's also possible that the episode never happened. And uh, you know another one of the apocryphal tales that acquire the status of truth because they're told so often. But what is clear is that players and fans who knew Western could easily believe the story uh, because he played so often with in, you know, injured or broken fingers. I, in my own, um, personal career back in 55 or 56 when I was playing midget baseball I got I, I broke my index finger or I, I, I jammed it bad so it it, uh, it hurt like hell uh, and uh, it was the second to the last game of the year and I didn't want to quit so my my old, my old professional manager or coach came up and he he, he uh, taped my two my index finger and my middle finger together with tape between the knuckles so I could essentially kind of throw the ball with three fingers is the way it wound up doing. Cause we only had, we only had one game left. And, and he said, uh, it was white adhesive tape. And he says, now, so the other team doesn't know you've got a bad hand. He says, go, go, go rub that in the dirt. So, <laughs> so they can't see the color. So, so stories like that have probably been going on forever. Um, Western, uh, split uh, catching duties with Ray Mueller for the balance of the 49 season. Uh, he, he, he didn't hit very well at the beginning, but finished with a 243 batting average, seven home runs in, in 169 at-bats. He became the regular catcher in 1950 and had a banner year. He caught 139 games uh, and set a major league record for catchers with only one error in 680 chances. That's for a fielding average of 999. It's hard to believe, but Florida catcher Charles Johnson went airless in 1997 to beat the record, and St. Louis's Mike Matheny went airless in 2003. That's hard for me to believe because it's pretty easy to get an error on a stolen base if you overthrow or throw one in the dirt. It's amazing that they could do that, go that long without one. Um, in uh, he was hitting about 270 early in the season until injuries brought him down to 236. But he hit 23 home runs and drove in 71 runs with just 103 hits. He had a career, he had a career day in a game against Cincinnati on June 24th in the Polo Grounds when he went four for four with three home runs and a triple and scored five runs in a 12 to two round. Um, he, in, in 1951, he lost some time early in the season due to a broken fingertip and both uh, hands are beaten up most of the season but he caught 122 games and was a key player 
the Giants uh, Miracle uh, pennant drive. The team was 13 games behind the Dodgers on August 12th, which was observed as West Western Day at the Polo Grounds, sponsored by Dutchess County. Uh, he was given a car by his hometown fans and friends, and he, he later joked that that, uh, that was the, that's what got the winning streak on that uh, permitted them to overtake the, the Dodgers. The, uh, I said, how times have changed. In 1940, his Clearbook friends, now Clearbook was a town of uh, 425, <coughs> 150 of them showed up for West Western Day in, in Crookston, Minnesota, and I gave him a pen and pencil set, uh, uh, probably wow. just what a 17-year-old wanted, but uh, I don't know. I mean, that maybe it's just that me speaking. Um, uh, you know, after the Bobby Thompson home run and the and the streak that the Giants made to get to the World Series, the, the World Series probably was an anticlimax, and and uh, and they lost to the Yankees four games to two. His hands were reported to be so sore during the season that he often had a hard time gripping the bat. He hit only 219 for the year, but he hit 20 home runs and was a tough clutch hitter. He drove in 70 runs with only 79 hits, drew 104 walks, and had a career-high 400 on-base percentage. Uh, Western's teammates heap prize on his unsung hero. Eddie Stanky said, he's a great guy for the pitchers to have back there. He gives them a lot of confidence. I'd say he's the most underrated guy on the team. Monty Irvin marveled at Western as well. His ability to play well hurt. He said, he said, if he could keep his hands in shape, he'll hit around 280 and maybe hit 30 home runs. Yeah, but what? Um, excuse me. But Western could not keep his hands in shape. He was destined to continue to have injuries. He got off well in 52. Played in 54 of the Giants' first 55 games, hit 12 home runs. And then he broke another <laughs> finger, re-injured it when he returned to action, broke a thumb, and then suffered a split finger. He managed only two run, uh, home runs and 14 RBIs in his last 60 games and wound up with the 220 batting average. He caught only 112 games. Of course, in today's major leagues, catching 112 games is probably considered going beyond beyond the, the pale for a catcher. He, now, uh, Western retained a starting position at 53 and 54, but injuries had taken their toll, and he was pressured by, by others. Uh, he caught all four games of the giant sweep of the uh, Indians in 54 series, but he'd only hit uh, 187 in 98 games during the season. He was back up to uh, Ray Cott, in 1955, Bill Sarney in 56, and Valmy Thomas in 1957. When, uh, when the Giants moved to San Francisco in 58, uh, Rigney uh, offered him to keep him as a third string uh, catcher if he wanted to play, but preferred to have him as a coach. Uh, Western decided to retire and uh, became a first base coach at San Francisco. As a catcher, he was respected for his astute baseball sense and field generalship. He often he claimed he could often tell when a base runner was going to attempt to steal by the way he took his lead from the base. And he, as a first base coach, he got a reputation as a great pitch stealer. He said many pitchers unknowingly telegraphed the pitches by the way they gripped the ball or stood on the rubber. Even if they tried to hide their grip, some tilted their glove or wrist a little differently from one to the other. There are other indicators as well. Uh, uh, the New York Mets catcher, Chris Conazaro said that Western who was with the Giants at the time, gave him some friendly advice while walking off the field after a 1962 game in the polo grounds. Watch your feet, Western said, when you come out after giving signs. He, um, Conazaro hadn't realized that he took a different catching stance for a fastball than he did for a curveball. Uh, I found out later, and I, I hadn't written it in my story there, that uh, Westrom had a uh, had a secretarial type notebook, a small, maybe five by eight, where he had handwritten notes 
that he kept during the year of all the of all the batters and all the pitchers he faced. Uh, had I had I known, uh, well, I'll I'll get to that later when when I wrap it up. But uh, what to signal the the batters uh, for a right-hander it was okay because a right-handed batter can see him at first. He might. He might uh, bend over for a curve or stand up straight for a fastball, but he'd use voice signals for uh, uh, for the left-handers and uh, got a got a, quite a reputation for being able to be correct most of the time. I heard a story recently, or I read something when they were talking about uh, sign stealing, where where a, a, one a fellow and I can't remember the name now. I apologize, but he's, he uh, he uh, he had quite a reputation in, and. Uh, one batter came up to him. He said, "You know, I am not getting any signals from you." He said, and the sign stealer said, "Well, I'm having trouble. Uh, I'm having trouble with this pitcher. I can't, I can't read what he's doing." And the batter says, "Well, you know, uh, why don't?" And he says, "I can only guess." And the batter says, "Well, your guess is better than mine." So, <laughs> so uh, uh, some batters like to like to know what's coming. Others uh, uh, are a little worried about that. Uh, Western moved his family to, to Phoenix uh, when his, uh, for his Giants coaching days and worked for the Arizona State Highway Department in the offseason. Uh, after the 63 season, he was involved in an unusual, rare coaching trade. Mets coach Cookie Lavagetto, who had just recovered from a serious illness, asked if he could be moved to San Francisco to get back to near his hometown in Oakland. After some discussions with owners and managers of the two teams, the Giants agreed to take Lavagetto as a coach to replace Westrom, who was made a coach for the Mets under Casey Stengel. In, uh, in July of 65, the Stengel, 75-year-old Stengel fell and broke his hip. A major surgery was required, and uh, Stengel pulled a surprise of some sorts when he told Mets President George Weiss to hire or to, to appoint Westrom as interim manager. Most folks thought his choice would have been uh, Yogi Berra, who was uh, uh, Stengel at once called his assistant manager when they were at, on the Yankees. Uh, the, the answer probably was that uh, if uh, Stengel planned to return as manager in 66, it would have been a lot easier for Westrom to step down than it would have been uh, for Berra. However, five, years, five weeks later, Stengel announced his retirement and uh, uh, Westrom had to wait till later in the fall before they finally made it official and, and hired him as the uh, as a successor. Uh, uh, I had never known or hadn't read much about Westrom back in the days when he was playing, but uh, he, uh, Stengel obviously was a, a no, loved by by reporters and the fans for his uh, his Stengelese, his great uh, great copy he gave him uh, for the way he spoke about the game. But but uh, Westrom surprised a lot of them by his uh, malapropisms is of his own. He uh, he paid a tribute to Stengel by saying, "Boy, when they made him, they threw away the molding." And in a in a in his first spring training as a manager in 1966. After a long extra inning game, he observed, phew, that was a real cliff dweller. So uh, uh, the, uh, uh, as, an, as an aside, uh, Westrom was, there were, there were fourth of five players on Leo DeRocher's 1951 Giants team that became major league managers. Uh, 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 Eddie Stanky in 1952, Bill Rigney in 56, Alvin Dark in 61, and Whitey Lockman in 1972. And then even the coaches, the uh, Herman Franks later became a manager. Of the, he was a coach on the 51 team, became a manager with the Giant, San Francisco Giants and the, and the Cubs. And uh, pitching coach Fred Fritz Simmons had managed the Philadelphia Phillies from 43 to 45. So quite a brain trust in that uh, 51 Giants team. Uh, 
Wester made a goal of, of getting to 70 wins for the 66 Mets, which would have been a significant improvement. They did make a six, 16 game improvement to finish in ninth place, only with seven and a half games ahead of the last place Cubs. Uh, finally, it was it was the Mets. Uh, uh, the fans were were turning on the on the fans. They they uh, Peter Goldenbach observed in his uh, history of the Mets. The fans no longer the rebels they once were. Were no longer interested in lovable losers staying home in droves. Without Stengel, these Mets were no longer lovable. Under the colorless Western, they were just another bad ball club. Um, as the season grew to a close, Western was looking for assurance that he would be rehired for 68. Uh, George Weiss, the, the uh, president, would not make a commitment. And, and finally, uh, Western, tired of waiting, uh, resigned in September 21. And uh, soon his old friend, Sam, San Francisco owners, Horace Stoneham, hired him back to be the team's first base coach. He remained a coach for four years and then became the Giants major league scout in 72. The Giants tapped him to replace Charlie Fox in, in June 28th of 1974. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he, the managerial change didn't do much for the team. They, they, uh, they went 38 and 48 under Western and uh, finished fifth place in the West Division. Uh, there were tough times for uh, Giants owner Stoneham, who was struggling financially. Uh, he, uh, Western guided the team to a third place in the West in 75 with an 80 81 uh, record. Um, uh, the uh, Stoneham sold the team to uh, to minority stockholder Bob Lurie, local real estate developer. Stoneham asked Westerman and his coaching staff to submit their resignations voluntarily before the end of the season. They refused, fearing uh, a voluntary resignation would make them ineligible for unemployment insurance. Uh, just prior to Thanksgiving holiday, however, Westerman and his staff were finally fired. Shortly, the, shortly thereafter, uh, 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 he became a scout uh, with the Giants, and then he signed with the Braves to be a part-time scout. Are we still on? Yes. Okay, I, something's come on my screen here. Looks like, oh, there we go, Zoom ad. <laughs> so he... Uh, um, he, he became a part-time scout, uh, kind of retreated, uh, and uh, he, uh, he, he, he died of cancer in, in 2002 in Clearbrook, Minnesota, where he maintained a summer lake cottage. Uh, at his funeral, uh, friends and neighbors reminisced about the, the guy. They said he was an un, unassuming fellow at, at, the, at the local Legion Club or wherever he was. Uh, he was just a regular guy. He did not brag or talk about baseball unless someone forced him to it by asking him questions. And then he'd be cordial and, and, and talk. But he said he was just a regular guy. Uh, his friends up there set up a, a West Western Baseball Museum in a 25 by 50 room uh, in the local Clearbrook American Legion Post. They'd done that in 1990. They collected stuff from Western's Lake Cottage to fill it up and he said, you don't want to take all this junk to town. He marveled. <laughs> he hadn't looked at some of the items for years. Some were just stored in old boxes. And um, now I'm back to my story on, on uh, Westrum's notebook. It was uh, uh, one of the fellows I talked to up there said that uh, that was a big treasure. It was really, a, you know, the day before computers and that it, it was it was sort of ad hoc pages written after it, but he had some summaries and, and uh, looked like a great pro. Um, but in uh, April of 2007, the, the Legion Post, uh, uh, Dwindling membership forced them to sell the, the post, the building they were in, and uh, they had to clear space from the, from the museum. And uh, the, the folks that had put the thing together in 1990 uh, met again and uh, 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 
packed the stuff up and sent them to a, a daughter of, of his uh, and their family living back in Arizona. <clears throat> I found out later that uh, that, uh, that some of the uh, that the family had put most of those items up for sale on an auction outfit you know, devoted to baseball memorabilia. I would have uh, I would have liked to maybe bid on that uh, on that notebook. It would have been interesting to see what it was. I never did. I was never able to figure out what it sold for. I went into it after it was over. Um, but that uh, gives you a kind of a short summary of the of the work I'd done on Wes. Um, I don't know if you've got any questions or Armand. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much for that very concise uh, report on Wes Westrom. Um, I'm going to open up with a couple of questions. Uh, through your research, I, I take it that you found out he was very cerebral, as as they say most catchers are. Right. I'd, I'd have to agree with that wholeheartedly. <laughs> and and my, my other questions don't necessarily have to do with uh, Western. It has to do with you being in Minnesota. Two quick questions. One, one question and one comment. Were you able to see Willie Mays on the Millers? No, I did not. I, I, uh, uh, he was... He was a, a shooting star at Miller. You know, he only played 40 games, I think. And by the time uh, I would have been or my uh, some of my friends in Hutchinson would have known about it, he was already gone to the to the Giants. Uh, um, I my like I said, my my father was a uh, graduated from high school in 1930. His family had lost a farm, and he had a hard scrabble. Uh, growing up, uh, not much time for frivolous, frivolous things like baseball and that. So he never knew much about the game. But I, we we did a couple of times uh, in uh, probably beginning in '52 or '53. The uh, the, uh, the the Minneapolis Millers and the St. Paul Saints had a rivalry that was probably just as bad as the Dodgers and Giants. And uh, the the games between the two teams were were pretty good. And and on holiday weekends, uh, during the summer, Memorial Day, July Fourth, and Labor Day, I believe, they had a they had a home and home doubleheader. Like they would play a game early in the day in St. Paul, and uh, and then go to Minneapolis for the for the for the nightcap. And um, my 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 fat my folks and and my my sister and I went down for uh, twice for those games. Nice. And my other comment was, you showed one book about, I guess, famous Minnesota play people, baseball players. Yeah. Um, how did you feel? Uh, I think you have it there. Not the yeah. amateur book, the other one. Yeah, this one right here. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add a comment that I, I think uh, I think last year, the Mets finally honored Jerry Kuzman, who I thought was just a fabulous pitcher and very well deserving. The Giants, uh, you know, in, in my my watching them, I always related him to Matt Cain. Jerry Kuzman was a fabulous pitcher, and he deserved to have his number retired by the Mets. Yeah. Bill Clink, you're up. Thank you very much, Gary, and thank you very much uh, for uh, Armand for a, a wonderful presentation. I think. In a lot of ways, he was the least heralded, uh, but certainly the most respected of the 51 Giants. Uh, rarely have I ever been anywhere where anyone brought up the word APBA, but uh, I don't know if any of the rest of you were APBA players, but Armand, my first APBA set was set, if you will, was the 57 set. And I spent many hours, uh, I was frustrated by the fact that the Giants were so bad they could never win any games on the yeah. 57 set. Uh, I had to wait for the 62 set to have a chance of having them win. I had friends who, uh, one, uh, a couple of guys played the entire, spent the entire 1966 summer playing APA, and I earned extra change from another, uh, one of my friends who later became a fraternity brother. I worked in the summer doing his score sheets. I would do statistics. And I think okay. I made 10 or 15 cents a score sheet. Uh, he compiled the statistics and then he would audit me, of course. And yeah. I, 
probably had a few errors in it. That was a wonderful game. I, I, I tell you, I never understood catching the way you explained it as far as the hazards go. And the idea of the fist, uh, yeah. using the fist uh, uh, until the very last minute to be able to, uh, uh, to guide uh, the, the mitt. Uh, most of us don't really have an appreciation of that. And uh, it would be nice if guys like Johnny Bench would call out uh, uh, West for you know his contributions to catching. Uh, yeah, my contribution yeah. is this, a photo I don't think you've ever seen of West. Let me see if I can get it there. Uh, there, you got it in there. That yeah. is a photo that I have seen where that's Willie Mays' first home run. Uh, it's signed by Spawn, uh, Wes Westrom, and Mays. And uh, guess who that catcher is? You recognize him, Armin. Walker Cooper. Walker Cooper. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. And I, I had to get a separate autograph photo of him because he had already died when I obtained this photo, but uh, it's the only photo of Mays' first home run. And Wes was there, to sh the first guy to shake his hand. Willie's home, uh, first home run, now you guys know, it was none other than Wes Westrom. Huh. Thank you very much, Armin, for a, a great and entertaining uh, uh, storyline about a guy that most of us, even as Giants fans, have overlooked through the years. Yeah. Just a comment on your follow-up on your app, uh, uh, the, the one thing we didn't like, they came with that little dinky dice cup, you know, those tiny. Yeah, I remember dice. the dice cups. So what we did was we, I don't know if you, we, the, we uh, frozen orange juice cans were probably about the <laughs> yeah, size right. of, about up to here. And we, we'd yeah. get those, we had two dice, we'd be shaking those and be driving my mother nuts. Yeah. They made so much noise. So she, she was a seamstress. So she wound up, took a couple cans stuff something down there. I don't know how much she glued some material around them and everything like that. So she gave us our homemade dice cup so we she would we wouldn't keep her awake all night from playing the game. Yeah. There's more to life than stratomatic. That's all yeah. I'll say. Yeah. <laughs> Those of us who are APA uh, well, aficionados like you like Armin and me and yeah. many I, other I used, I used to carry a briefcase around. I I I kept the statistics for our various leagues and stuff we had. Oh, you, know, you did that too yeah. yeah. And about Five years ago, I ran into a friend that I hadn't seen for 50 years, and he was uh, he was uh, telling me he was still playing APBA or APBA. We, you know, but now it's computerized, and he said, you know, you can you can essentially push a button and the whole game gets played, or you can go at bat by at bat. But it'll uh, but the game will uh, will print box scores and keep statistics. You know, you don't even have to do that. I don't know. It took. Got to have the you got to have the dice and the hit and run book. Yeah, yeah, you got. <laughs> and and the thing about it is, of course, you probably know is by after you start playing it for a while, you didn't even need the cards. <laughs> you knew you, you, you know, <laughs> you shook a you shook a thirty four and it was a fly ball to center field. I mean, I still know it. No, I haven't. I haven't played the game for fifty years or something like that. So it's a. <laughs> Sorry, guys, for the walk down memory of Zappa, yeah, uh, but I couldn't avoid that one. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Ed Freer, you're up. Unmute, Ed. Gary, can I say something? Yeah, Ted, right after uh, Ed, okay? Okay. Ed, you're up. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Armin. I was anxious to wait your uh, show because I grew up in Poughkeepsie. And um, my father knew Wes a little bit, just problem association. Most everybody in the town did. Mm -hmm. And he took me to a 1954 game where I clearly could see Wes catching and everything, you know, and we're enjoying it. One of the things he talked about when we get into catching was, and I guess it must be in the book somewhere, is about Hoyt Wilhelm. When he caught, he would have a special mitt. Are you familiar with that? That was oversized? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the the, the uh, I mean the the thought there was that the, the a good knuckleball was going to be breaking almost too late for the catcher to to be able to catch it. So they figured if you got a bigger mitt, at least you can touch the ball. You know, I you know the the modern catcher's mitts now are are almost like first baseman's mitts. You know, the uh, you could uh, I know when I played. You know, and I, I stopped playing in '64. It it was 
almost impossible to catch a ball one-handed. I mean, you, you could, uh, uh, but uh, uh, it was difficult. But now, the, now they, they uh, but I'm in awe of, of catchers today. The, the, uh, uh, the way they're trained to block balls in the dirt. Uh, my, my, my coach uh, taught, taught me to, uh, to try to block balls. He'd have me put my arms behind my back and he'd stand out and he was an old pitcher. He'd throw balls in the dirt and had me, you know, figure out how to block them just to knock them down to, you know, keep them on the field. But uh, the, the catchers now, uh, they, they, they play almost like a goalie and they lean forward. And I never figured that out to do that so that when the ball does come down, you know, half the time it'll bounce straight down instead of, you know, going off to the side. But, uh, you know, you watch, you watch a game and I'm just uh, in awe of, the, of how good those guys are. The, I mean, the, the pitchers uh, most time have no fear of throwing them a little breaking ball or, or something in the dirt because they know the, the poor sap back there is going to knock it down somehow, you know. Okay. Thank you. And uh, yeah. thanks. Ted, before I got to you, Armand, when he uh, joined the Mets, did he retain his Poughkeepsie residence? Uh, you know, I don't know for sure. I, I, I don't, he, think so. I, think, could, I don't think he, could, he came back. They no, had that back. parade for him. Because he'd already gone to San Francisco. Yeah, they had the parade for him like in 55. Yeah. Thank you. Ted Lavender, you're up. Yeah, I just want to, uh, to tell everybody that someone donated many hundreds of mint condition baseball cards to the uh, Metropolitan uh, Museum of Art in New York City. And you could see. Uh, cards from the late 80s to the early 1940s. Two that I remember seeing just recently was uh, Mel Ott in the, in the late 30s and Carl Hubble in the late 30s. It's certainly worth uh, 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 going up there and taking a look at them. But there's, I don't know if it's hundreds or, or thousands, but uh, it was a, a great donation and they're all in mint condition. Thank you, wow. Ted. Yeah, I, I had, uh, to my regret, probably, uh, no, I had probably three Mickey Mantle rookie cards. Wow. Uh, and, but we didn't know that they, they were just bubblegum cards, right? So, you know, some of us use a coal spin and put them on our bicycle to make noise, you know, uh, riding on this, you know, on the bicycle, clicking on the spokes and everything like that. So they were just kids' toys, you know, we penny a piece, you know. Norm, you're up. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. I really do enjoy going down memory lane, and I'm a stratomatic guy. I'm sorry about that. But <laughs> um, um, you touched on, actually, you just answered my question. I was going to ask about if you have the Mickey Mantle baseball card, but you, you touched on something that I think is overlooked about Wes Westrum when you mentioned that he had a 400 on base percentage in yeah. 1951 with a 219 batting average. Yeah. That's 181 points higher on on base than batting, and his lifetime of um, 356 on base is 139 points higher than his left-hand batting average. Mm -hmm. The guy must have had a great batting eye, and I'm wondering, I mean, you had met, mentioned about the broken fingers and all that. If he wasn't a catcher, do you think he would have been a really good hitter? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, the uh... And the, the on-base percentage, uh, I mean, he was, uh, uh, you know, an eight, eighth place hitter most of the time. And uh, the, but the pitchers, you know, generally they just fired the ball through those guys, you know, they, uh, and uh, they, uh, they must have respected his power because they gave him so many walks, you know, I mean, I think in combination with, with his eye, I mean, he obviously wasn't going to be swinging at a, uh, pitches out of the strike zone, but still the, the uh, you would think that the someone hitting one 180 or something like that, the pitcher might not be too afraid of him. Thanks, Norm. Thank you. Me online? Okay. Frank, you want to say something? Well, I'll wait my turn. It's your turn. Um, you've spoken about um, catches not making errors during the season. 
but I believe my correct that catches past balls don't count as errors. That's correct. Catches have, have very few, have much less chance to make errors than, than other players. So do these guys um, that had no errors during the season, did they have past balls? Uh, you know, I didn't look that up. I'm sure they did. Uh, you know, most of the catchers, most of the most of the errors that they can they can run up are throwing errors. You know, either on a either on a bunt or or stolen base, and you know it's a um, you know you you know uh, it's it's not hard to figure out that somewhere in there he's going to make an errant throw sometime during the season. How about the pass balls? How about pass balls? Pass balls do not count as errors. Oh. Yeah, that, you know, that's uh Okay. And I guess that's a tough tough call, uh, you know, the you, even it's hard to sometime for the official scorer to determine whether it's a pass ball or a wild pitch. And then if you were if you were if you were to throw error in there, it would really make a uh, ulcer yeah, but also, also <laughs> before the uh, before the Posey rule, as we all know, Buster Posey got hurt. If yeah. a catcher caught the ball and was run over and he dropped it, that was an error. Yeah, yeah. So yes, there are ways to make errors, Frank. Gotcha. Uh, <laughs> Bill, you're up. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Peterson. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it was very informative and I enjoyed it very much. I just wanted to ask, uh, even though on a pass ball, the catcher doesn't get an error, but uh, if a run score, is it an unearned run for the pitcher or not? Yes. You know, I don't. Uh, no, up here. I. If you don't know, that's okay. I was just. I, I don't know. I guess if just from my, my my guess would be if uh, if the runner scored from third on a pass ball, I, it might be unearned. But uh, if the runner goes from first to second on a pass ball, I'm not sure. And then eventually scores. I don't know how they would score it. I guess that's a good question. Uh, um, I, I I don't know the answer to that. I yeah, no, I'm gonna guess okay. that yeah. yeah. And I wanted to ask you if on the book on uh, <clears throat> Minnesotans, if they have an article there on Dave Winfield, who was born in St. Paul and played college baseball at the University of Minnesota. Yeah, yeah, he's in the book. Matter. Okay. And I, I yes, he, he's he's on the on the on your on the bottom right there in his San Diego uniform on the cover. Uh huh. <clears throat> Okay, and he happened to be born the same day that Bobby Thompson hit his uh, shot hurt around the world. Huh. Anybody uh, else with a question for Armand? Yeah, you know who but a baseball fan would remember that? <laughs> you know <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Anybody else with a question? All right. Um, again, this I downloaded this because I'm a Saber member. This book is a fantastic book that Armin contributed uh, to. Um, it's available on Amazon. It's like 20 bucks. But if you're a Sabre member, you could just download it. Armin, we can't thank you enough for giving us all your time tonight. Please don't be a stranger. Okay. Well, it's and, always fun uh, to talk baseball. Great, great job tonight. Wishing everybody a happy uh, Thanksgiving. I'll, I will close out the room. If anybody Same wants to, you. to hang out and talk oh, baseball, be well, guys. guys. Okay, bye. Norm, did you get that video I sent you today? Um, no. Um, was it an email or a text? Email.